Nouriel Roubini is a best-selling author and economics professor at New York University's Stern School of Business. He doesn't consider himself a pessimist, but his warnings about global economies have earned him the nickname Dr. Doom. And Rubini's predictions have been spot on. Among other events, he foresaw the global financial crisis of 07 and 08. Because he's been so right, everyone from pundits to policymakers wants to hear what he has to say. As the New York Times put it, he's the seer who sees it coming. Rubini's new book, Mega Threats, is sounding the alarm about the next great crisis, which he says could be bigger than anything we've seen before. Noriel, great to see you. Congratulations on the new book, Thanks. I guess, Mega Threats, a little bit gloomy and doomy, but realistic, as you like yeah. to say. You have 10 mega threats that we're facing, and I want to get into all of them. Um, but I was struck by the very last two sentences of the book, which says, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy ride through a very dark night. So just collectively, is the picture right now really that bad? Well, I just spent the last few days in Washington for the annual meetings of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And there are people literally starting to talk about uh, the risk of World War III, literally, because we are in a geopolitical depression. One of the many mega threats in the book is one that we have now a confrontation between US and the West on one side, a number of revisionist powers. It's not just Russia, it's China, it's Iran, North Korea, and even Pakistan, in effect, is an ally. They're essentially challenging the economic, social, and geopolitical order that the US and Europe and the West created after World War II. We have a Cold War, and there's a chapter of the book about the new Cold War, but there is right now that this Cold War eventually ends up into a hot war. There's already a hot war in Russia and Ukraine. This conflict can escalate and get NATO, the US, and allies involved. It's a risk. Russia is seriously threatening using tactical nuclear weapons. The negotiation between the US and Iran on the nuclear, nuclear deal are not going anywhere. And Israel is saying, if they're going to become nuclear and they're one step away from it, we're going to attack them. We'll have another major shock. And look at what's happening between US and China on the South and East China Sea and Taiwan and so on. We are also, unfortunately, on a collision course with China. So right now is a cold war. It's getting colder and the economic consequences are severe. Deglobalization, decoupling, fragmentation of the global economy, deglobalization, balkanization of global supply chains, trade in goods, in services, in movement of labor, capital, technology, data information is going to be split. We're a divided world and there's going to be a world in which there'll be more inflation, less economic growth because instead of producing the most efficient parts of the world, we're now talking about French shoring, about secure trade rather than free trade. That is a fairly gloomy picture, and there are 10 mega threats yeah. in your book. Let's talk about economics, though, first. Yeah. Stagflation, which of course is inflation and a stagnant economy at the same time, which we saw in the 1970s, but you said that what we're gonna be going into right now makes that look like a walk in the park. Why is that? Well, we are having, like in the 70s, a number of negative supply shocks, uh, three of them currently. One was the COVID shock that led to a shutdown of economic activity, bottlenecks in global supply chains, reduction in the labor supply, and so on. Second one was the Russian invasion of Ukraine that led to a spike in energy prices, food, fertilizers, industrial metals. And third one, this year is the continuation of the zero tolerance COVID policy of China. Those have led to a reduction in growth and an increase of cost of production. And with loose monetary and fiscal policy have caused inflation and now a sharp slowdown of growth. We're headed towards a recession. However, in the book, what I point out is that the era of great moderation where growth was okay, inflation low, 2%, is over. And now we're going towards an era of what I call great stagflationary and debt instability and crisis. On the supply side, there's not just the three negative supply shocks. In the book, I identify 11 other ones that are more medium long term. They're going to reduce potential growth and increase cost of production. Just to be brief, first of all, deglobalization and protectionism. Secondly, reshoring of manufacturing from low cost China to high cost Europe and US, French shoring. Three, aging of population, not only in advanced economies, but also in major emerging markets like China, like Russia, like South Korea and so on. Young people produce and save and consume less. Older people don't produce, and this save, that's inflationary. Four, 
We are having restriction to migration. In the past, migration from south to north, from poor to rich, was keeping a lead on wage growth. Fifth, we have a decoupling between US and China. Six, a broader geopolitical depression. Seven, we have now climate change that in many ways creates a reduction in growth and increases the cost of food, of water, of energy, and of fuels, and so on. Additionally, we have other shocks. We have cyber warfare. We have pandemics going to be coming more frequent and more virulent because of climate change. Climate change causes more zoonotic diseases. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have a backlash against liberal democracy and populism of the extreme right and the left because there is a rise in income and wealth inequality. Authoritarian, aggressive autocrats, populists of the right and the left are coming to power. They blame the rest of the world and they go to war like it happened in Russia. We're also weaponizing the US dollar as a tool of national security and foreign policy. That oiling system of the global international monetary system is breaking down and that's going to lead to more friction, more cost of production, less economic growth. So on the supply mm -hmm. side, these are 11 factors that are medium long term. And on the demand side, we're under a mountain of debt, not just public debt, but also private debt. There's a debt trap. So central banks have no option but monetizing these fiscal deficits. And like in the 70s, we have negative supply shock. We monetize fiscal deficit, we end up with inflation, recession, stagflation, but we end up also with a debt crisis. Why so? In the 70s, we had negative supply shocks, but debt ratios in advanced economies were low, so we didn't have a debt crisis. After the global financial crisis, we had a debt crisis, mortgage debt, housing banks, but we had a negative demand shock and a credit crunch, so we had deflation. So we could have massive monetary and fiscal easing. Today, we have the worst of the 70s with negative supply shocks and the worst of the post-GFC period where we have right now debt ratio that are higher than ever in history. Let me ask you a question. So we're going to have a stagflationary right. debt crisis. Right. Often recessions or downturns are caused by a lack of demand. But you're saying that this could be caused by supply constraints. Is that correct? How Absolutely. unusual is that? Well, in the 1970s, we had two negative supply shocks. One was the Yom Kippur War between Israel and the Arab states that led to a spike in oil prices in 73. The second one was the Iranian Revolution that led again a spike in oil prices. This time around, the spike is not just in oil prices. It's in oil prices, it's in natural gas, it's in food, it's in fertilizer, it's in industrial metals, it's driven semiconductors. Global supply chains have bottlenecks that have not been resolved. The zero tolerance policy of China is leading further to these supply bottlenecks. And as I pointed out, these are just in the short run, Russia, Ukraine, COVID, China. There are 11 other forces that are medium long term that are all of them also negative supply shock, reducing growth, increasing the cost of production. And we lose monetary and fiscal policy. They lead to inflation, recession, therefore stagflation. Now, another problem you see out there also an opportunity, is artificial intelligence. A lot of people are pinning a lot of hope on AI, but you see potential downside there. Yes, yeah, the that? downsides are that while AI, machine learning, robotic automation increases the economic pie potentially, it also leads to losses of jobs, of labor income. And initially people thought it would be only routine jobs that are mechanical, like some kind of low value added blue collar jobs. But increasingly right now, even cognitive jobs that can be divided in a number of tasks are also being automated. And even creative jobs, there are now AIs who can create actually a script of a movie or make a poem or write art or paint or even a piece of music that soon enough is going to be top 10 in the Billboard magazine chart. We're getting to a point in which AI is going to disrupt massively all sorts of jobs. Just to give you one example, it's only a matter of time until we're going to have autonomous vehicles. It's great because there are about 300,000 people who die every year of car accidents. Two million have serious injuries. If we can even reduce that by 99%, social is a great thing. But you have what? Five million Uber and Lyft drivers, five million truckers and Teamster. Their jobs are going to be gone for good. Which kind of jobs are they going to get? Initially, people were in agriculture. Then they move into industry. Then they move into services. Now, most of the automation is occurring in services, including transportation. Let me ask you about deglobalization, because it seems to be a big theme. And yep. it's obvious there's a lot of authoritarian regimes in the world which are cutting off um, you know, the WTO, all those agreements. Why is that? What is it in, in the human being's mindset that goes from democracy to authoritarian and back and forth, it seems, over time? 
Why does that happen? <clears throat> First of all, there is a backlash against uh, globalization because globalization led to benefits. The economic pie grew, but like technology, it led to winners and losers. And we did not compensate or give new jobs to the losers. Lots of people in low value added industry, but now even services are losing their jobs and income. That's why there's a backlash. There are also environmental issues. Now there is geopolitics, like French shoring and secure trade, and so on and so on. I think that the rise of these authoritarian regimes of the extreme right and left, and by the way, it's uh, Putin in Russia, is Erdogan in Turkey, is Kaczynski in Poland, is Orban in Hungary, is Meloni now in Italy, is the Swedish Democrats right now that just won in Sweden, is the Brexit decision. It was on the right, of course, the election of Trump. And there are also populists of the left. In Argentina, there used to be populism of the left, in Venezuela, but in the last year, in Peru, in Chile, in Colombia, and most likely in the elections in Brazil, populists of the extreme left are gonna to come to power. Mm -hmm. I think that is driven mostly by economic malaise. When there is a rise in income and wealth inequality, and we've seen it across the world, in advanced economies, emerging markets, those who are left behind, it doesn't matter whether they vote for the right or the left. Those who vote for the right are usually socially and religiously conservative. Those who vote for the left tend to be liberal. But on economic issues, they're nativists, they're nationalists, they're against migration, they're against free markets, they're against the forces of economic reform. Why? Because they're left behind and they blame the elites, economic, financial, political, for leaving them behind. That's why there is a severe economic reason behind this backlash against liberal democracy and extreme populism of the right and the left. But as we know, populism of the right and the left doesn't lead to economic opportunity. Eventually, it's to inflation, stagnation, and financial disaster and default. How worried should we be about the U.S.-China relationship? Uh, it's a very serious issue. I believe that we are already for sure in a Cold War and we'll have a decoupling between U.S. and China, trade in goods, in services, in the movement of labor, of capital, investments, but more importantly right now, everything this uh, important is having to do with technology, data, and information that is from a national security point of view, severe and important. So the decoupling is occurring. The Cold War between US and China in terms of overall political and geopolitical relations is becoming worse. And the reason why Xi Jinping right now is seeking a third term and possibly a fourth is not because he wants to pass to history as the man who reformed China, it's because he wants to pass to history as the man that united mainland with Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I believe the next five to 10 years is gonna be the time where there's gonna be a confrontation between US and China on the issue of Taiwan, and that could be a trigger of this Cold War becoming a hot war. We don't know whether it's gonna happen, how it's gonna be resolved, but that's where we get to World War III, among other things. But in some sense, World War III has already started. Mm -hmm. It started in Ukraine because this conflict has broader implication than going well beyond Russia and Ukraine. It's the beginning of something else. You didn't mention climate change, so I'm assuming you're not worried about that. <laughs> well, there is a full chapter about an uninhabitable planet, about climate change. And it's a long discussion, but the reality is there's a lot of talk about doing something about climate change. There's a lot of talk about ESG investment, environmental, social, and governance, and so on. But the reality is a lot of it is greenwashing. Mm. A lot of it is green wishing. A lot of it is green fig leaves of people who say we're going to do something. Governments, firms, individuals, they're doing nothing. Glasgow and COP was a total failure. At the current level, we're headed towards an increase of temperature by the end of this century of three degrees. Even two will be a disaster. Three means that half of the world will be in places that are either underwater or too hot to live. And if you worry about a few hundred thousand migrants from Central America moving here, wait until there be not a few hundred thousand, but millions or billions of people who have to move from places that you cannot live to other parts of the world. That's gonna be an economic and financial disaster. All these mega threats, Nuriel, yes. what can we do about them? Well, in the book, after the 10 chapters where I discussed them one by one, in each one of them there are solutions, mm -hmm. there are two paths for the future. One is dystopian, and the other one, what I call utopian or less dystopian. In the dystopian one, of course, all these things feed on each other, and there's an interaction between each one of them, and then we end up into essentially disaster. We can destroy each other with a nuclear war, with geopolitical collapse, with climate change, with financial meltdowns, with collapse of liberal democracy, with pandemics, and you name it. There's another part in which we have 
policies at the national level and international level slowly, slowly resolve this problem and therefore the future maybe is not utopian, but we avoid the disaster. It's still a challenged future. It's one that is lots of trouble, but we manage it. However, in the epilogue of the book, after this 12, 11, 12 chapter, I say, mm -hmm. from my point of view, I believe that the dystopian mm -hmm. one as of now is more likely than the utopian. So mm -hmm. the utopian, of course, is the desirable one. The question is whether there's a political will domestically, internationally, to cooperate and collaborate to avoid the coming meltdown and disaster. I fear not. Quick two-part last question. What do you think of the nickname Dr. Doom, which is what people call you, number one, and number two, are you ever optimistic? Uh, first of all, uh, I usually say that I'm Dr. Realist, not Dr. Doom, but it's more catchy to be called Dr. Doom. Okay. And I think that warning about the risk is very important because until now, we've been kicking the can down the road. We've been sticking our head under the sun like ostrich, and right now we're facing major mega threat, economic, monetary, financial, social, political, geopolitical, environmental, health, trade, and technological. And unless we address them, we're headed towards disaster. So it's worth to have people like myself who warn you about the risk, and for every problem there is a solution, but at this point we cannot keep on kicking the hand down the road, because we're reaching the point in which these things are gonna materialize in a way in which, not only in the next 10 years, mm -hmm. each one of these mega threats that I discuss about the next decade is materializing today. If you look at them one by one, debt, inflation, stagflation, environment, geopolitics, pandemics and dynamic as things are happening today. So we have to worry about it today, not about the future. Noriel Rabini, thank you so much for joining us.